Hi, welcome to the diversity in bug hunting uh, panel. My name is Sarah Jacobus. I run the Android Vulnerability Reward Program at Google. Before I hand the mic over to these fabulous women to talk about their background and just to give a brief intro, uh, I do want to give you all an exciting announcement. The Android Vulnerability Reward Program has just expanded to Google devices, and for a short time, we will be offering higher rewards for vulnerabilities found in Nest, Fitbit, and Chromecast. So if you have any questions on that, feel free to find me after the panel or check out bughunter.com. <laughs> Bughunters.google.com for more information. All right. So with that, I'll hand it over and ask you all to give us uh, a brief introduction and talk a little bit about your background. Hi, uh, my name's Jan. I run the security team at Brave Software, and uh, I've actually been on both sides of the equation. So I used to be more of a vulnerability researcher. Um, I got bounties from Stripe, from Google, Chrome. Etc. Um, but now I actually spend most of my time running the bug bounty at Brave um, and trying to get more people to participate. So my name is Francisca Bühler and I'm the CISO of a Swiss company called Puzzle ITC. We are um, a DevOps company with an engineering focus. I joined them in 2019 and I always had this passion for security. So I also pushed this topic very hard for this company. And last year I became the CISO of this company and now I have a security team and also a security championship program. And one of the latest things we did was a private, time-limited bug bounty program. And that's why I'm here now. That's one of the reasons. And in my spare time, I'm also a co-developer of the OWASP core rule set where I help to maintain, uh, enhance, and write rules for web application firewalls. So it's apparent that my focus has always been on defending much more than on attacking things. Hi, I'm Sheetal. I'm the Chief Information Security Officer for Finova. Finua is a fintech, it's a crypto custodian company, and we're based in Berlin. Um, I have around 20 years of experience in information security, and, uh, well, I've worked on both sides, both, both in security engineering as well as compliance. I, my first journey, I think, with bug bounty started around eight years back, um, with Hacker One, it, it was a really good experience. Uh, I liked it so much that I even opened it internally inside the company and uh, benefited from bugs being identified even inside that we wouldn't have identified with a penetration test. And we wouldn't have known because only internals have that kind of deep knowledge. So I'm really looking forward to this discussion today. And uh, yeah. I hand over back to you, Sarah. <laughs> Thanks so much. All right, so for our first question, in 2019, a study by Bug Crowd found that only 4% of bug hunters are women. Another study found that only 24% of the cybersecurity workforce are women. Why do you feel there is not more diversity in computer security? I also want to touch on that um, I am specifically mentioning uh, women in the questions that I'm asking, but this panel is about diversity in computer security, so feel free to talk about any aspect um, of, of diversity. Well, <laughs> I think um, in general we can say the more diversity a community has, the more creativity we have and the more ways of thinking and more ways of approaching things we have. Um, and I would like to mention the book Insecurity by Jane Franklin, and she really covers this topic really well. And she says that uh, women have another way of thinking, that women tend to assess risks differently than men do, and they are highly intuitive and very creative, and these are very important things that... Um, very important skills that we could use in this um, in this cybersecurity field. And I would also like to mention a study that was made uh, with GitHub pull requests in 2015. Um, researchers investigated 3 million pull requests on GitHub 
um, they found out that pull requests written by women are more likely to be approved the first time than pull requests written by men. So I think this is a really important fact. And another important thing is that this changed as soon as the reviewers knew that it is a woman that opened the pull request. So as soon as it was known that uh, a, women, a woman opened this pull request, it was less likely to be approved. And I think now we come to this problem that we all have these biases in mind. And I think this is one of the problems we have, that we are short on women. And Chen Franklin also says that um, we are less secure if we are short on women. This may sound a bit provocative, but uh, yeah, I think she's right. <laughs> Yeah, so kind of to go off of that, I think one of the really great things about the InfoSec community in general, and in particular bug bounties on platforms like HackerOne and BugCrowd, is you, you don't really know the gender of the person you're interacting with. Like, it's often very anonymous. Um, yeah, I've seen you know, probably hundreds or thousands of reports at this point, and I don't really know the statistics until you said it, because it's just anonymous. But um, So one time a few years ago, I did go to this event called Bountycraft that was hosted at DEF CON by uh, Google, Microsoft, and Facebook for some of their top vulnerability researchers. So there's only people there who had like reported um, high or critical severity bugs to these programs. Um, and I was actually really shocked because I think there was one or two women there out of like 50 to 100 people. Like it was myself and I think like Natalie Sylvan. So, sorry, I can't say her name, last name right, but Natalie from Project Zero, <laughs> um, who's, who's really awesome. Um, and I don't, I don't have a hard time explaining that because I think the statistics for women in infosec are actually a lot better than for, um, for bug bounty programs from what I can tell. Um, one thing I, I have noticed is like with the bug bounty program, um, you have to deal with a lot of rejections, right? Like you have a lot of times that someone says like, this is not a valid vulnerability and you can spend a lot of time on something and not get any like payout. Um, and so that might be frustrating for people who are like new in their careers and just trying to like get a job where they can have like steady income. Well, uh, when I think about it myself, I don't think about it as, uh, say, women in bug bounty as such. I just think about it as um, the woman problem. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, I think I will even, I think I've also experienced it as per personally. There's, um, a lot of difficulties and challenges that you have to overcome, uh, right from the beginning of your career. Um, the way people, uh, I, I, I would say, I'd like, you know, sometimes when a statement in tech is made by a man, it is much more likely to be accepted than when it is made by a woman. And uh, so that that is something that is really not right, but I have experienced it, and I've tried my best to make sure that uh, that if there is a woman in my team, she doesn't feel the same, or if I notice someone else facing that, I uh, I highlight it because uh, what I see why this happens is because uh, gen generally you feel like. Um, maybe women are um, are not seen in tech so much, and so you try to stereotype them to another job. Uh, coming from India, where, you know, 50% of my class was full of girls, I never faced this issue so much that, you know, they don't um, kind of uh, take you as seriously as they would take a man. But I, I did face it abroad. <laughs> so I'm, I'm a bit, uh, uh, like, uh, surprised by that. But I think it's also, it's... So when we, I would just say that when we see that happening, we must make sure that we step in and ensure that we ask ourselves if that is a bias that we have about women or it is uh, something that that is uh, inherent. Yeah. So a follow up question, she tells something that you mentioned and and, and also Jan is. Um, actionable steps and things that we can do. Given that we are all here at a security conference right now, there's a ton of other folks in industry and at companies, um, you know, while we're here talking about it, are there any piece of his, pieces of advice that you would give, you know, the folks here, allies, companies, other women in the field to make this more conducive to women in diversity in security? 
I think role models are very important. So if uh, women see other women succeed, they begin to believe that it is possible. So I would say connect with other women, be part of communities, and this can help a lot. And But I also think it's the um, companies or communities or conferences, um, they have to, to do some things right, like um, to, to use a gender neutral language, for example, and to show diversity and to show uh, women on image, so images, so that other begin to believe that it is, it is just normal. Um, yeah, I think we should maybe also uh, shift away from this problem. We, we have are short on women and see, hey, but we are women here. We, we are a f female, uh, women only CISO panel, so I think this is pretty cool. So, yeah, focus on that. Focus on the positive things we have. So, uh, kind of going back to your observation that women's pull requests tend to be accepted uh, on the first attempt. Uh, as long as the gender is not known. I think, uh, so I also reviewed talks for DEF CON and I noticed a similar effect where, uh, women who submit talks are, their talks are generally accepted at a higher percentage. Um, in the sense that, like, yes, there are a lot more men submitting talks to DEF CON than women, but the likelihood of a woman's talk getting accepted is higher because there's fewer women applying and the talks are generally higher quality. Um, so I think there's a maybe an effect where not only women but also minorities who feel like they have something to prove um, or have to do things you know right the first time are just trying really hard to get things perfect before they even make an attempt. So they make sure their talks are really polished, like are really impressive up to the DEF CON standards. Or in the case of a bug bounty, they make sh they're you know hesitant to submit a bug unless they're sure it'll probably get a bounty. Um, so perhaps uh, one advice I would have is just kind of lower your standards a little bit mm -hmm. and just, um, you know, like perfect is the enemy of, of the good or something where you just submit things as soon as you, you think it could be viable versus trying to really like perfect it first time. And I would also say it's uh, totally fine to ask for help if you need some help. It's Yeah, and it's even allowed to fail. I would go even further and say... Everyone fails from time to time, so this is okay as well. But um, yeah, it's sometimes difficult <laughs> if you're afraid of it, yeah. All right, so I'll move on to our next question. And this one is focused a little bit more just on bug bounty programs in general. And that is, what can companies do to encourage more participation in bounty programs? And how can companies forge better relationships with their researchers? I, I think a bug bounty program should be seen kind of a collaboration, cooperation uh, between the hunter and, and the, uh, the company. So I think for the company it should be, it's important that um, they respond on time for the findings they have. And I think one important thing is um, that they are friendly to the, they are thankful because the researcher probably invested a lot of her time to find a vulnerability and to help my, uh, to help secure my system. So I should be thankful the work she did and appreciate the work she did. I think this is important to like meet at eye level and have a good partnership. I think this is important. I, I think that's really important. I think that's something that uh, really hit home with me the first security conference that I went to is, you know, really hearing uh, how much time and effort researchers are spending into this and when companies, um, you know, are not being transparent and they're not responding quickly. I, I feel like sometimes the message that you're sending is we're not valuing you or, or your work. So uh, that's a lot of the, the feedback that I've gotten from other conferences as well. Yeah, so having having been both a researcher and running a bug bounty, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding and, and frustration because as a researcher, often you feel like people are ignoring you, like they'll not respond for months or they'll say, like, we're, we're busy with other things. Or sometimes people won't even have ways to report a bug that you, know, you can easily find on their website and so forth. Uh, but on the company side, you get so many um, spammy reports. <laughs> um, my coworker, Andrea, calls these bug bounty, <laughs> where people are just like, uh, like, you know, it's not a really, really critical vulnerability, but they try to make it sound like it's really bad. And when you say no, they, they'll come back and just try to like 
get you to pay out. So I think uh, on both sides, people need to have patience and just like have empathy. I have a question to you. Um, is it allowed to not respond to back bounties or? I try to always send a, a response, but sometimes and they come back again and again, and sometimes oh, it's enough now. Yeah, the best part is when they start to like threaten you, like um, intentionally or unintentionally. Like if you don't respond to this, we'll publish a blog post and it'll make you look really bad. And I think, for, for, from my perspective, I always respond at least and say like, "This is why we don't think this is valid." But at some point, if I don't feel like they're being completely um, If I think they're being a little disingenuous or trying to like really exaggerate what they're doing, we'll just stop responding because we know that even if they do publish that blog post that makes it sound really bad, we have like a solid counter argument <laughs> to why we didn't fix it. So uh, from what I understood, your question was how can you increase bi diversity in the bug bounty programs you run? Uh, when I think about it, uh, to be very honest, I would not, um, I would, <laughs> when I have a managed program, I have a limited budget, uh, I want the best researchers, right? And, uh, and I think, uh, um, if, if I come from a, like, probably a very large enterprise, of course, you can have that benefit of saying, yes, I will give some additional, uh, you know, points on, you know, making sure that we also have women researchers in our bug bounty program. But I see that most startups, to be very honest, would not be in that position to say, yes, I dedicate a certain section or quota of my, my uh, bug bounty program to women. So, uh, but what I have seen is, uh, I feel like it is pretty fair, to be honest, because it is anonymous. It is, uh, um, so uh, uh, what i've not i've not really felt that it has any kind of um disadvantage for women that you know to shine out yeah so if they want to you can right it's it's all anonymous and you have to just prove yourself uh so you touched on a really interesting point and something since you know we're talking about diversity in general um there are also studies that have shown that there is a much higher likelihood that individuals with autism um, and those that are neurodiverse are uh, more of them are in computer security than in the general population and as someone who you know runs a bounty program that was my first thought well it's not on me I have no idea who this individual is I don't know their gender I don't know their age I don't know anything about them but I think to an extent it's also on us as as people who run bounty programs to make sure that our language, our emails, and our processes are conducive to people of all cultures and all ways of, of thinking. So the ways that we word our rules pages, you know, is this going to make sense to people of other cultures? We started trying to make sure that we're not using things like euphemisms. I know I say fire off an email all the time, and that is something that literally won't translate. Um, so I think that is important to keep in mind that you know, we can proactively make this a much more inclusive community. All right. So um, next question is, what advice would you give to someone starting out in the computer security field, especially young women or those who are diverse in a minority group in security? Well, uh, when, when I think about it, I feel um, they should just not be afraid. They should believe in themselves. They should know that security is a tough field. Yeah, you would uh, sometimes you're like you're expected to know everything, and that's just not possible. Uh, you have to know your strengths and you have to stand by it, and you have to keep learning. Right, that's part of life, so, and you will learn as part of your job. So be confident of yourself and know that you will succeed. Uh, don't let negative criticism or, you know, like even when people ignore you, let, don't let that bog you down. Just march ahead. Uh, I think you have to keep that positive outlook and keep moving on. And I would say um, to her, did you know that uh, women apply for a job if they meet 100% of the requirements and men apply for a job if they meet 60% of the requirements? So I would say have this in mind because I think 
women sometimes feel that they are less capable to do things, but in fact they are not. And so with having this in mind, this can change maybe and help maybe to, well, to, to believe in, in herself. That's actually something an old coworker of mine uh, said when we were writing job listings was uh, initially we were just saying, saying kind of like you need these skills and these are also good to have and then you should also have these skills. And it was just a long list of skills and we kind of had the implicit expectation that people would apply even if they didn't have all the skills. But then a coworker was like, actually, you know, women are more likely or even minorities are more likely to only apply if they have all of these. So either be really clear that you don't expect everyone to have 100% of these qualifications or just, you know, leave some of them out. Um, and I would say for people starting out into careers that, uh, I, I really like open, the open source community. I think, um, you know, when I, I, so I, I studied physics and I kind of had to, um, like self teach computer science and programming, um, after graduating. And one of the ways I learned the quickest was just from, uh, using open source software saying, there's these bugs I want to fix or I want to be fixed. So therefore I'm motivated to fix them. And then like participating in those communities, especially if you're not at the level where you can get a job or internship easily. Um, you can still contribute to open source. So if someone looks at your resume and they say, it says like you've had patches accepted to these projects, like that counts for something, even if you're not, you don't have any prior work experience. I would say this concept of mentorship can help as well, but sometimes it's not that easy to find a good mentor. But I think this is maybe something that could help as well, or mentorship and to have a good mentor and see others succeed as well. Absolutely. Uh, so one of the questions that at least I think that I get asked the most when it comes to bounty programs is for, for anyone, any stage in their career, you know, any, anywhere in the world, um, uh, people who are looking to submit their first bug, it's very intimidating. Um, like you said, maybe the first one to few dozen bugs might get rejected, but what would you recommend as a good starting part? How can you break into this this world of bug bounty programs? So I think my first bug was um, actually just based on uh, having having read someone's blog post, um, like a hacker I really respected about a certain class of like web app, like CRSRF bypasses or something, and then just looking for other websites where this might be a thing. Because he initially found it on GitHub, and then I found it on some other websites. So that's like a kind of easier way is like seeing like what kind of bugs have been accepted by big programs. And if I just take this bug and look for it on other sites, I can submit it to those programs and get free money. Um, I think another thing actually from the uh, people running a bug bounty side of things that helps a lot is being really generous with when you allow people to disclose. Um, because especially for people starting out in their careers, a big reason they participate in bug bounties is so that they can put it on their resume and write a blog post and get some attention for it. So if you make it really hard for people to write a blog post, they're less likely to be encouraged to participate. Well, I'm not a hunter, I'm not a researcher, but I would say um, also have a look at old vulnerabilities, have a look at old reports. We kind of learn a lot from them. And sometimes things repeat. Sometimes when I see a report, I say, oh, no, please, not this problem again. So I think oh, maybe that is a good starting point. Uh, so I know that all of us up here are more on the side of running bounty programs. And I know, Jan, you have some experience uh, with reporting. But what would you like to... What advice would you like to give researchers? Like, this is something that I see all the time. Please stop doing this or please start doing this other thing. Um, and maybe on the flip side, not to put you on the spot, but <laughs> if there's anything that you wish that bounty programs knew or would start doing. So I, I, I don't know if this is like the right audience to um, tell this to, but we get a lot of reports where people just ran like an SSL scanner and it's like you use the cipher that's slightly out of date or insecure. Uh, we really don't appreciate reports that are just copy pasted of automated scanners, although sometimes they are actually valid. Um, and then, yeah, I guess on the flip side, I think as people running programs, like I said, make it really easy for people to disclose. Uh, bugs if they want. That's that's probably my biggest thing. 
I would say for the company, it would be really helpful if I get a good report, if I have a step-by-step -step guide on how to reproduce it, because um, maybe the developer doesn't have this security knowledge, but the researcher has, so she can explain um, why this is bad, and maybe even on how this can be mitigated. This would help a lot. And I think if... Um, the researcher provides more information why this is bad or why this is a problem, how this can be mitigated. I think the awareness can grow um, at the company's side because if they only fix this one report, it's not, uh, well, maybe the same error will happen again. And if um, we kind of begin to collaborate um, and explain why this is bad, the awareness can grow and maybe we can, we don't have this problem anymore in the future with uh, this kind of vulnerability. I think this uh, awareness, security awareness on the developer side is um, a really important aspect as well, I think. Yeah, I think I agree with you guys. Uh, you need to have, uh, I see that a lot of bug bu uh, bounty hunters, they, when they're very, really just focused on that one line and they love uh, doing what they do with bug hunting and malware detection and all of that, they uh, do not focus on any other areas. So I think you have to realize that the audience that you are reaching out to is uh, probably not the bug hunting type and they're just uh, dealing with um, creating code and they don't really understand the impact of what you're describing. So uh, it is, of course, very important that you learn to communicate it well and not in that aggressive or in a very bashful manner, but more in a very collaborative manner that uh, will help both sides. And for me, as a company, I always think it's uh, very helpful if I know that the research has a, a lot of knowledge about the technology I use. So then I have the feeling that, well, we never have this 100% of security, but uh, maybe if um, I have a, a researcher that digs deep into uh, a technology and knows a lot about it, then I feel kind of almost bulletproof. Yeah, I know we don't have, but if... Uh, I know that researcher has a, note, a lot of knowledge of this technology. I think this would be good. And I also think that um, reconnaissance is as important as um, exploiting things because for the last bounty program we had uh, a large scope, a wide scope. And of course, I hope it's not the fact, but maybe we have systems that we have forgotten that they are running. And I think these are the systems that are dangerous as well because they are not patched anymore. So I think if um, others help me to find maybe forgotten systems, this would be helpful as well. Well, I hope we don't have, but we never know. <laughs> Wow, you guys were really nice. I was expecting. So I'm like, oh my gosh, I wish they would stop sending us this. <laughs> um, but we, uh, before we turn it over to the audience to see if any of you all have some, some questions for our panelists, uh, final words, any other leaving thoughts that anyone had? So I really like it when people give us actual proof of concepts, not just... So we got some reports that are really vague about why, the, like, we don't really understand why it's a vulnerability. But if you can, you know, actually, like, take over a domain or, or do something like that and, and show us, then we immediately will notice and, and triage it much faster. Um, and I know some people are hesitant to do this because at least in the U.S. there's uh, CFAA and there's other anti-computer abuse and uh, crime acts Um so I think, like, on the company side, you can just make sure people know that you're friendly to researchers. You're not going to sue them if they uh, breach something for the sake of showing vulnerability. All right. Well, uh, we'll turn it over to the audience and ask if anyone has any questions. Um, so my question goes to you. Since you have a lot of experience, you know, finding bugs and all that. And uh, I want to know how you keep up with tools. Because there are just vast majority of tools coming up. And, you know, um, I, I think small dev 
he writes a lot of tools and all the other researchers do. They write tons of tools, certainly API, such a lot of domains and all that. So how do you keep up with those tools? Oh, thanks. So I, 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 so I had the same question early on in my career. I'm like, well, oh, Burp Suite, like Kali Linux, so many things. Uh, how am I going to get good at them all? And the answer is you can't. So uh, there, there's so many bugs in software that really, if you just get good at a few tools, you can find bugs. Um, and I think the general message is don't try to be good at everything. You're not going to be like an amazing uh, browser exploiter and also like an amazing um, cloud hacker at the same time. So. It's better, I think, to specialize and just pick one thing you're going to like get really good at and focus on that. But of course, you know, always keep, try to keep learning. <laughs> so, uh, my wife looks at me uh, doing security and doing bug bounties and doing pen tests on the sides, and she she looks at, oh my god. You got so much money. We don't. Yeah? Um, and you need to teach me how to do pen tests. We're going to be rich. So he's, she's uh, fully motivated uh, financially. I say it's not only that. So, <laughs> and she knows nothing about computers, which is okay. Uh, what is the recommendation for you? So how do I deal with it at home? I, I really, <laughs> I really want to help. I do not only want to fix the printer. Yeah? So, I mean, I, what is the advice you have for me? Well, I think not the money is important, of course. I think it should start with a curiosity, that you are curious to learn things, that you want to understand how it works, and so on. And so I think it should start with this passion for security and not, yeah, not uh, because of the money, I think. <laughs> so uh, from what I understood, I feel she's quite curious as well. <laughs> And uh, I think, uh, well, you could start with small things that you're, you're an expert in, right? And you know that uh, they are easy to pick up. It just has, Jan said, probably a blog that might inspire her. And she could search for the same thing somewhere else and uh, giving her small exercises that she could feel confident of executing. Uh, I know I'm the moderator, however. <laughs> um, I will say, too, something that I really like to do with uh, people who are very new into security. I think it's such an overwhelming space. Um, something that I also really like to start with are some easier capture the flag competitions, because I think right off the bat, you are like, oh, my God, I'm a hacker. You know, I'm like running through all this code. So I do think that that is also a way to get that, you know, reward uh, feeling earlier. Any other questions? All right. Well, if there are no more questions, I just wanted to add that uh, if you participated in any of the Google challenges, we have a ton of prizes that we're giving away. And we're going to be doing that at the Google booth in the other room at th 3 o'clock? At 3.30. <laughs> so hope to see you all there. And thank you so much for coming.